reducing the stresses of e-commerce on the uh, chain uh, fulfillment um, from a, a 3PL perspective. Um, I live in Switzerland, so everything has to be done in a certain process way, so excuse me for, for that. Um, so we'll, we'll talk today about, um, and I will share with you experiences on uh, Omnichannel, the stresses we have, the things that we can do, um, how we take away pressures, the role of collaboration, and I'll do some specific focuses on people, customers, technology, and I changed my presentation yesterday. It used to say operations. It now says CSR because we had a lot of questions yesterday in, 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 uh, about CSR. So I, I will talk about CSR, which I think the company I work for, um, there's a lot of things, uh, good things in CSR I'd like to change. Um, so myself, I'm, I'm not 25. I'd like to be, I think. Um, I've got three decades of, uh, of experience originally from the UK. I've not lived there for 25 plus years now. Um, I've worked in different elements of the supply chain. I've worked for retailers, I've worked for manufacturers, and I've worked in the 3PL industry. So I've worked around quite a bit in different parts of the world. I've lived in Russia, Poland, Netherlands, France, even the United States I've lived. Um, uh, and for the past 10 years, I've been working in e-commerce. So really from the start of when e-commerce really started in, in a big trend, um, I've been uh, working for, with, with different people. I love challenges and relationships, etc. cetera. So those, these are the things that get me up every day. Um, just a couple of slides on ID logistics. I don't want this to be an ID logistics cell. If you want to know something about ID logistics, you can come and ask me. We have a stand here, go on the internet. So, but I just wanted to give some background to uh, where where we were and what we are. So it's it's a French company. It's relatively young company. It's twenty years old. Um, present in eighteen countries now. We fundamentally do contract logistics. So. For those of you who have spoken to us about freight, we're, we're not really into freight, so we're doing mostly warehousing, two and a half billion turnover with 30,000 employees. So quite a, quite a sizable company. This company is interesting because it doubles about every four to five years. So if you go back in our history, um, our, our business plan for 26, we'll see the, the company um, uh, double in size. Um, if, if, if I've only been in ID uh, just about a year now, uh, and people said to me, what, was, what did I find very different about ID? So some, some key things that uh, I would say are different. One is about customers, innovation, CSR. It's a very interesting mix, um, but very passionate about those things. And, and since the foundation, so our first customer was Carrefour, the French retailer, and it's still one of our biggest customers today. I think it could be our, actually our biggest customer. So we have been supporting them throughout those, 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 that period. And what's also very interesting, and I, I'm still trying to think, and if everybody can help me with the answer, um, ID Logistics started in grocery distribution, which is a very specific part of logistics and breeds a certain mentality. So if you've ever worked for it, a grocery retailer, Walmart or Carrefour or Tesco's, they have a certain mentality around cost and service and speed. So that is now in our sort of DNA. So from grocery went to non-grocery to e-com and now uh, we're spending a lot of our time um, developing in fashion. Um, it would be remiss if I didn't say something about the United States as we're here. So. Um, uh, ID Logistics bought a company in the United States last year called Kane Logistics. Um, we now have 42 sites here uh, and, and 12 and a half million um, square feet um, and pretty much spread through most places you would want to, uh, to be in the US. Sorry, this clock's not working or I'm sort of I'm stuck in time, but uh, I don't know if someone can turn the clock on. Otherwise, I might be here till eight o'clock tonight because I don't know how many minutes I've done so far. Sorry for that. <laughs> <It's a good laughs> Thank you, sir. So, um, so this is a bit about who I am, the company I work for. Okay.
we could have some fun, couldn't we? So this is one of the last speeches of the day, yeah. Um, I could say some crazy stuff. So let's, let's just have a quick look at where we are in the markets. Now, this is opinions. We've all got opinions, you know, right or wrong. My opinion of myself, my colleagues, and, uh, and, and I've been through. So if, if we go back through, you know, go through, back through COVID, this terrible thing that happened to us, um, a lot of things we had pre pre COVID are not the same now. We we, we see that we 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 know that yeah. Um, if you look certainly in Europe and some degree, and I think the United States to say, the markets are very unpredictable. So I can literally, in my job, I can have a one customer phone me, ask me for extra space, and they're selling too much and life's terrible. And then the next phone call could be another customer saying, hey, hey please, it's, it's the absolute opposite. And, and I don't seem to find any consistency. Um, so sometimes we have customers growing rapidly and sometimes we have customers very slow. I think the outcome of that is things are a lot more unpredictable, um, which is breathing a certain mindset you have to change. So recoveries in, are inconsistent. Um, if, if you look at the difference between the United States and Europe, because there are a lot of differences, yeah? Um, um, so in the United States, there, I started off with the word predominance of insourced, and my American colleague said, no, it's not a predominance. There are a lot of insourced operations in the United States, yeah? Which breathes uh, something different as well. I think economics in the US are better than Europe uh, in, in general. Um, seems to be a lot of requests for automation in this environment, and we can talk about why that's so, but that seems to be definitely the case. And of course, you've got more multi-site operations. You've got an East Coast, you've got a West Coast. You may have something else as well. And also as well, my, my American colleagues will tell you, the growth of sort of employer of choice, whatever words you want to use, that is about really taking care of, em of employees is, is growing, yes. Um, now, if you, look at, if you look at Europe, I mean, uh, you can make jokes about Europe and we're all depressed and all that type of stuff, but the, the, the economics of Europe are not as favorable, absolutely, definitely, and if there's any Europeans, in the room, you know, we've had the war in Ukraine, we've had massive, massive inflation um, uh, increases, of which affected all consumers. So, m just myself, my mortgage has gone up, but my house, house has gone, gone up three times. times. So, the money I had spare for to go out or go on holiday is, is slowly disappearing, and I think many, many Europeans are, are like that. And also, environmental concerns as well are. Oh, are quite spectacular. If you went on holiday in the Mediterranean, if you were lucky enough to do that this year, you basically fried because uh, temperatures were quite extreme in, in, in Europe this year, as in many parts of the world. Um, the other thing that is relevant here is e-com is now firmly set in many markets. Yeah? So wherever you go, you have e-commerce available um, and people, it's no longer seen as being an, an unusual thing. People now use e-com, including our parents, and everybody is now um, in, in this e-com mindset. So, there's a gentleman here who's going to help me. It's competition time, okay? Now, because I work for a third party, there's no actual prize, but you can have some glory, so I, I need to keep my cost, costs down, okay? So, here's the question then. What, what are your, and there's a whole group of people, I don't know who's here, what, would anybody like to tell me what their challenges are of doing e-commerce or omni-channel? What what's, the, what's the top things that uh, create problems for your businesses? Anybody want to shout them out? <laughs> oh, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> centers is very important so that's, good that's a big challenge so good people okay yeah. so there's a thing around people yeah okay there was a, another lady here oh we need to record this to manage returns <laughs> <laughs> thank you so returns people anything else 
Ah, come on, there's, there's only two things. Your life must be wonderful. You must be going home at three o'clock. Uh, final mile delivery for large and bulky items. Okay, final mile delivery. Um, on certain days that's inconsistent. Yeah, okay. So fluctuating demands. <laughs> and Anything else? Okay. I'm glad you said that because that was a bit of a dangerous proposition because the list I'm about to put up may have been completely different. So um, here's, as we say, here's one we made earlier. Yeah. We all recognize these things. Yeah. So we've got... We've got labor, we've got demands, we've got shorter lead times, etc. Um, quick startups is a, is a thing for me as well. When customers come, I need something next month or next week or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, some things are, are getting better. So we had a very bad period of automation equipment uh, lead times, so it's better. But the, the big thing in there is it was also around costs as well. The price of racking in Europe doubled. Uh, pallet position cost X, it now costs X times. Yeah, so there are uh, uh, very significant issues here. And, you know, and how do we look at those as a third party? How do we try and bucket to solve those? So these are the areas of which we, we try and focus on. So volume capacity, how do we manage fluctuating volumes that the lady said here? Yeah, so how are we doing that? Pricing is, is, is a very point there. Flexibility, how do we get extra space? Um, I'm sorry, volumes and capacity goes back to people as well. How do you get the people? Often when you get the people, they haven't got the right skills. We're finished with the questions now, sir. So thank you. Um, and now, and, and also things like uh, new solutions. So those are the, 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 the areas where we, we tend to look at and, you know, if, if I now go down into how to solve those. So the first one is people. Now, uh, I've been in this business a few years, I think 20, 30 years ago, someone was telling me that HR, people are our most, our best asset, and it was all sorts of different slogans. And, uh, you know, I worked for Unilever back then, and we had slogans about how, how important people were. Yes, they were, but now they're even more important. Okay? So... There is an absolute shortage of skills, of people, sorry, and of skills. So when you found the person, then can the person drive the fork truck? Can the person do the WMS? Can the person, as you were saying, yeah. Um, we also have transient workforces. I know you have these in the US, you certainly down in Europe, where people just go from one to the next, to the next, to the next, okay? Um, and also expectations. So I don't know how many of you have got teenagers who are working. I have teenage daughters who are working and they'll, they'll work somewhere for a week and they say, I don't want to go back there. I'm going to leave. Like, what? <laughs> I didn't like the bus trip or something. And then they decide they don't go back there. And it, to me, that's not how certainly my generation is. We went to work for a summer job and we stayed there. My kids move jobs every week. Yeah? So there's a different expectation. And the impact there, okay, is not rocket science. So we're not hitting demands. So we suddenly get an extra thousand orders dropped on us. We didn't expect it. No one expected it. So we don't have the service. So we get reduced service levels. It's also driving automation decisions. I don't know if there's any automation people in the room, but I don't wish to offend you in my speech, but this is driving an automation discussion. So people, customers come to me and say, I need an automated warehouse. And I go, okay, I, I don't mind selling you one of those. It's uh, many, many millions, but that may not be the answer. That really may not be the answer. So because you can't get people, you say, well, I need, I need some form of automation. So it's potentially driving some, some, some decisions that may not turn out so well. And then, of course, you have other areas of supply chain planners. I mean, who would want to be a planner in this environment at the moment? Because they're the people who have to sort out the mess because the product doesn't arrive, it's not receipted, the returns aren't taken back, etc. And, of course, all of that manifests itself into higher costs. OK, so it's a fairly depressing situation. I don't know why we work in this business. We should have been insurance salespeople or something. We're another industry. So in terms of what... We've, we've tried to do as an organization in terms of, 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 of best practice. So again, uh, 
things that you will recognize. So one of the things we've really spent a lot of time on is about the attraction of people. Um, and these things are very easy to say. Um, so one of the things we have found is, and I'll give an example, is about how technology helps you in work. So we have a very large, very large, half a million square feet operation for a beer company in Madrid. Uh, and they sell mostly cans. Has anybody picked up a tray of cans? I'm sure lots of people have picked up. If you pick up tray, trays of beer cans all day long, I can tell your back is really in pain. Okay, So we, we recognize this, and we've brought in a very simple machine that has suckers on it. You pick up the can and you move it from this pallet to this pallet. We've gone from a situation where no one wanted to do picking, now everybody wants to do picking. So it's just very simple ways we've looked at roles, jobs. Um, Flexibility of working contracts. I mean, how many of you, and I'm sure this group does, but lots of people don't, you know, do you offer part-time? Do you offer two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, between uh, when kids are at school, etc.? A lot of people don't. You'd be amazed how many people say, no, your job is from seven in the morning till three, Monday till Friday, yeah? Um, and 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 we can... I think at times we will say people will move for, say, 10 cents extra. Yes, they will do, but if they're happy and they're content and the job's good, you should be able to, and we certainly have been able to, keep people um, in, in the, the workplace. workplace. Retention, um, quality of schedules, um, the flexibility, so holidays, uh, shorter hours, longer hours, working different days. Um, and then around uh, management involving people um, and fairness of decisions. And from what, from what I see in the United States, a lot of this is about sort of employee engagement, employer of choice. Yeah. So making uh, places um, the best places to work. Again, very easy to say, but having these uh, things, these are things that we have to do if we're going to solve this, uh, this, this people challenge. Customer, I, I like putting this in there um, because a lot of a lot of people don't actually listen to customers, which is amusing to me. Um, that what customer needs an actual customer wrote that for me. So I asked this person over dinner one night. I said, write down the things that are important to you, and that's what this e-commerce customer wrote down. Say his words, not 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 mine. Um, and it's around need and honesty. And the other things is that. Certainly within the e-commerce and retailing world, things change absolutely rapidly. So I've had experiences where I've signed a deal with a customer for you know, 100,000 square foot. By the time we'd gone to implement it, it was 200,000 square foot. There was no point moaning about it or groaning. Uh, we just had to accept that this was, uh, we got on with this, uh, the task in hand. And, and you know, what, what's our responsibility as third parties? Um, you know, we have to focus on, on service, cost. Um, in ID, we have, and I know my former employer, Kuna Nagel, did as well. They had very vigorous uh, customer feedback, which is very good to understand what the, the feedback is um, and what people think. Um, active, we use the word contract management, but account management. So having someone dedicated to that customer. Um, and then sort of continue to learn. One thing I appreciate in my current role is I have senior management involvement, so the CEO right right from the day one of a of a of a, of a customer relationship. Technology, um, technology is wonderful. I I again work in a company that spends a lot of money and time on technology. You know, very simple. A lot of people still don't really think about what and where and who so <coughs> you have, sorry, you'll have customers um, excuse me you have customers come to me and say um, <coughs> um I need a, an automated warehouse. And when you start to go through the parameters, the volumes, the markets, the changes, 
is really quite alarming to see how many people don't think that through. You know, if you put down an automated warehouse, you're talking at least 10 years, if not longer. Yeah. So that means your demand for that vicinity, that product, has got to be at least 10 years long. Yeah. Um, you're talking tens of millions for very large automated sites. So there's got to be a process there about thought. But automated is brilliant. If you know your volumes, you know your markets, and they're consistent. So I have a conversation with an American retailer at the moment about Los Angeles. They're going to build an automated warehouse because... Los Angeles will always be there, hopefully. People always still want buying grocery, so it's there. If you go to a remote part of the Midwest, that may not be the same. So automation can be brilliant in the right place. Um, something we've developed, and, and many others have, have developed as well, is a hybrid model. So this is taking regular standard warehouses and putting some form of automation into them. So because warehouses are, are nice and convenient things, you have individual process, you have intake, you put it into a rack and you take it out, etc. you pick it. Um, you can start to automate single parts of, in a modular uh, setup, um, the, uh, the warehouses. So automated solutions, yeah, discuss that. And there's some brilliant ones out there that some people exhibiting here. Um, but... For, for e-commerce and, and particularly other parts say in fashion, we, we're tending to offer modular uh, automation. So an example that may be AMRs doing, helping you doing the picking, so goods, goods to person, for example. Um, we've deployed AGVs, reach trucks, which take pallets off the loading bay, take them into the rack and rack them, and then come back and get another one. Some of them... Most of them work, some of them don't work, and you have to go back to the beginning. But this is a way of, um, of, of how to do this. The benefits of that, it's easy to implement. You don't need to do it all at once. Um, automated solutions, and I'm sure many of you have done these, they take a long time. You, you're talking years to implement some of these, uh, some of these projects. But both of these will solve some of the problems with um, with 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 people um i'm i'm blessed in the sense i've worked for a company which is is one of its founding peoples around csr um and i don't think this is always the case so this is just an example i've taken one of our standard corporate slides these are the three areas that we we focus on one is people and second environment and third is community um, so people, we, we do a lot around, uh, you know, fulfilling people's ob objectives. It sounds very sort of like a consultant told you to say that, but this is about how people develop, how people, uh, get on within the company. Um, and also safety as well. I'm still shocked to see how many sites I go to, I don't consider to be safe. So it's about creating safe workplaces. I'll come back to environment in a minute. And then community as well. This is about where the site is in a community. So they're doing community actions and charity and open days, etc. The big one for us is around the environment. Um, so we have uh, very extensive monitoring tools, which aren't that complicated to do. Uh, you just need to get yourself organized. How much gas did I use last week? How much electricity? Um, and then just have a plan to sort of reduce them. But it's, um, again, it's one of the things that doesn't always um, get uh, top priority. So how, how do we, how does Ideal Logistics score? And I have to be a bit careful here. I couldn't put all the numbers in, but I tried to put as many as I can in. So. We have sickness levels less than 7%, quite a bit lower than 7 um, I, I see, I, I go to sites of customers where they've got 20s and 30s. And I'll, I'll, 20, 30% of, you, of your population can't be sick, so there's something else going on. Yeah, but we do that. Um, 
we're reducing our accidents by 40% they're very low if I look at the customer journey and I talked about the customer before so 98% of our customer retention rate I think that must be one of the best in the industry now that excludes when a company stops and moves somewhere else but for regular ongoing business um, we use this net promoter score that I know a lot of 3PLs uh, do and then interesting in our companies 55% of our customers work with us in two or more countries so it means that they are moving um, moving to they are uh, they are working with us in multiple locations technology we have technology competitions which i found a bit strange but we have competitions to see how much technology sites can introduce and they get quite a big prize yeah um, but it really does create an atmosphere of i'm trying to bring in innovations each site has to bring in at least one uh, major innovation a year so the average for last year was two and that could be an in a major innovation would be implement amrs it could be implement uh, uh, new technology in picking trucks i mean it's not like uh, you know putting up a sign on the wall and then csr we have 10 objectives we externally monitor them um, and they're continually reviewed at, uh, at at the executive board level um, every two months Okay, so wrap up. Um, we talked about people. It was a key key thing that we, we discussed. Uh, I've just tried to show some of the things that we do um, and how we've been successful in, 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 in getting people. Customer relationships is, is, is absolutely critical um, and important to work with those customers. CSR, we've discussed and, and and then technology becomes affordable and there's a l I don't know about yourself I, I I will see some technology some AMRs for example um, we have one we've deployed some we're deploying in the US one I know in France it's it's 200,000 euros and I've we've replaced uh, eight people now 200,000 euros of investment in a big warehouse is not a huge amount of money and we've reduced the head count by eight. It's a fairly small thing um, that we've we've managed to do. And it, if you keep chipping away at that, um, you you can bring some significant benefits in. There you go. And I'm on time. Yay! Yeah. So, questions, comments, statements. Throw things at me. No, don't throw anything. At any, anybody disagree with these? I mean, I tried to give you an, an insight to what I see in my company sees and what we do. Anybody have any particular say, well, that doesn't agree. So, gentlemen, sir, he asked me about getting people. Does any of this help you? Is it all sort of, is it just normal stuff, but it's more about the implementation? Sorry to pick you out, but no, I know you, were, right, you said you were going to be my friend. I'll here. help you. I'll do whatever you want. I'll... <laughs> It's keeping them in a in an Amazon town, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It, it, that's it's that's a different kind of competition, and so the flexibility we have to do that, and where where my facility is, we have to do. If we don't, I lose the people. You yeah. can't lose good people because they have a sick kid at home or they. Yes, know, exactly. That's Everybody has life, but we have to let the work. Yeah. The work you have to, or else you'll have no one. So I agree with that hundred percent. You got to deal with the the people in a way you wouldn't in the past. You just can't do mass firings every time they don't show up. Or you'll exactly. have nobody in there but yourself. And exactly. A lot of boxes in the back. Yes. Yeah. Life, life changed that in some place. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments, feedback? I'd like to get your feedback. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Richard from uh, Schneider Electric. So one question, I guess, some best practices so with the people and the technology is how, is how are you developing them? How are you recruiting? As we add more technology, you have new skills. Yeah. Um, so what are the best practice do you have? And where do you sort of go external? Do you have internal programs? And how do you attract that talent for new roles for the to support the automation endeavors? So um, to, uh, several questions there. So technology for us is largely done centrally. 
so we go to the different robotics the author source we have a team that knows everything you would want to know so if you're on a country or a site you go and ask them first because they did all the homework okay those are very difficult roles to fulfill um, these are very specialized people and if you want to be nice to your warehouse associate you should be you should be extra nice to those people um, so that's that's how we do it I think there's another key point here is about mindset about what your executive board is thinking about technology so if your executive board doesn't think about technology you know you're not going to get very far I'm I'm lucky my management board my boss drives me up the wall talking about technology and innovation he's an engineer by training yeah so he comes from that background and he is he'll look at a proposal and say well we could do that we could do that so again he's a bit of a mindset thing going so it's, that's one thing at the site level 20 odd years ago i was a site manager i was a general manager of a site uh, i thought i was okay at it um, but i'm not an engineer i manage people is what i did you know, trying to get the picking rate up and the trailers unloaded. Now, many, a lot of that has now changed. So you don't want people who can go out and motivate people just solely that. You have to have people who can be, who understand that technology. And sometimes some of these sites, and I'll invite any of you to come and look at our site. Some of our sites are highly complex places. Yeah, highly, highly complex. Uh, and I don't even talk about black box automation, just simple, you know, goods to person in say a cosmetic industry with all of the different racking and mini load systems, etc. So that's taken a different skill. Um, so I think it took some time for, for us all to realize we didn't need just a people person, we needed a people person and <laughs> an engineer as well. I think that's now uh, more, more understood. But it's, it's not an easy transition. It's really not. Yeah. But I don't know if that answers your question, sir. Yeah, it does. And just do you, uh, are you fostering a lot of these internally? Or do you have a sort of building a pipeline of that talent? Um, and going back to the CSR thing and about the people, we try to do as much internally. Okay. Uh, that's what we try to do. And that's to give people new opportunities. But also, we also have an expectation, if you're a site manager here, or you're an operations manager here, you should expect, potentially, you may have to move and you may have to go and work at a site, say, 50 miles away, or whatever that may be. So there are, it's, a, it's, a, it's both, both expectations uh, there. But going out into the market is, for a lot of these roles, is very, very difficult, uh, for any, any role. I just spent one year recruiting a director of fashion. One year. Um, he starts on Monday, so I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm really, <laughs> I just hope he just needs to turn up now. Yeah. We're taking one year to recruit one, one role. Um, I'm sure you all have similar stories as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. having a good conversation this is good i'm i'm impressed i, I already mentioned that uh, uh, every site uh, take initiative you know launch two uh, innovations so my question is is that a site decision or is a regional decision how this technology decision is made that's a good question so we have um so each each site is told you must do one or two innovations okay um, and then we actually have a, a book of innovations. It's like a, like a menu. We, we have this. So we take the team that has the innovation and the automation team. So they, they make a menu of things like AMRs and AGVs, da, 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 and they've worked out how to do it. So they know how to do it. So if you're a site manager, you have to look at exactly what, what you need per site. And then you will go to the menu and say, ah, I think that would solve that problem. So if I have a picking problem, for example, and I want to do goods, goods to person, I will look at it. I will then be in contact with the central engineers. We fill in some data and they say, no, no, don't, don't do that. There's, there's no business case there. 
Um, but it's up to the site managers to lead the process. And they are helped. They're given a target. They have to lead it. Uh, but they, we give them as much help as we possibly, or they possibly need from us, essentially. I was told not to fall off the stage. I'm just going to fall over, fall over the furniture instead. Anything else? Any three PLs here? <laughs> no. Any other questions? You all want to go to the bar or the swim pool again, don't you? Yeah. Or are you you're still recovering from last night? Yeah. You should have jet lag from Europe, and you're going to bed at six o'clock. So <laughs> that's one way to solve it. But you do wake up at three a.m. Any other questions, comments? Did, did I fulfill the uh, objectives? Good. Okay, thank you.